Bibles to John chapter 3. John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. And I've got to say this again. Now, this, this is for real. These are my favorite verses in all of Scripture. They really are. I mean that. And, and I, I'm not just saying that. Verses 14 and 15, if somebody were to ask me, what's your favorite Scripture verses? It's these two verses. I love what they represent. I love what they mean. I don't know how many times I have preached um, these verses. Yet again, um, I don't preach the same message twice, and I'm really glad that I didn't this time, because here's the danger of preaching such a familiar text to yourself, is that you can kind of take it for granted. I know it all, and I've, I've been there, and I've gone through it, and I've dissected it, and I know exactly what it's saying. And so you kind of just brush over it and don't really um, dig deep into it like you would other things. But here's, here's the neat thing. Just last week, sitting out on the deck, talking with Sarah's uncle, um, Scooter, who, who shared last week, and, and somehow we came to these verses. And I said, these verses are amazing. They're my favorite verses. And he opened my eyes to something that we're going to talk about. Another section of Scripture that, you know, I know, I know that I've read the Bible through at least once. And I know I've read every word in it at least once. But there are times where stuff just jumps out at you. Stuff you missed or stuff you passed over or stuff that you just thought wasn't there. And he introduced me to a section concerning this that I never knew was there. And I know I read it. And I was so thankful to have that conversation with him because he had no idea that this message was coming up. And so it really allowed me to dig deeper and to take the end of this in a little different direction than I ever have before, which you're going to understand why I inserted Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus in that last song. It's going to, it's going to make sense when we come to pass with the end of this message. So let me read to you now John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Actually, you know what? I'm going to start before that. I want to start all the way back in verse 3. No, verse 2. Talking about Nicodemus, it says, This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. You hear its sound. But you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And now our two verses. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for its truth that it is. As we, we've shared this many times, but Lord, You just amaze me with it that it is living and active. And we are always being able to learn and dig deep and study and be transformed by Your truth. No matter how many times we've read it, no matter whether it's our favorite verses or not, Lord, they still speak freshness into our lives. And that's what I pray, Lord. Thank You for allowing us to to read the entire section of what was going on with Nicodemus. But Lord, help us to understand these last two verses. Holy Spirit, You come and You teach and You open our hearts to receive Your truth. In Jesus' name, Amen. And the reason I wanted to share from the beginning of what's going on with Nicodemus is because this is the last of the dialogue we have between the two. This is... 
the last Old Testament lesson that Jesus is giving Nicodemus. And we've gone through this chapter, and we've seen how Jesus took Nicodemus, who was a teacher of Israel, who would have studied the Old Testament, who should have known it inside and out. He took him to Ezekiel 36, and he took him to Ezekiel 37. However, the teacher of Israel needed to go back to school just one more time. Because Jesus had one more place in the Old Testament that he had to teach him. And so you got to remember where Nicodemus is in all of this. He's, He's stupefied. He's dumbfounded. He can't take all of this in. His mind is literally being amazed by what Jesus is saying. And then taking him to the Old Testament, which he knew well, which he taught... And again, just just amazing him, blowing his mind. It's the best way I can put it. And so here it is. He said to him, you've got to hear if you're going to be born again, and, and you've got to understand this, Nicodemus. You must be born again. And here's the thing about this. If you're not born again, And if you're not placing your faith in Christ, what this becomes is not good news, but condemning news. It's not good news to know that you've rejected Christ and you will not enter in. This had to be really hard news for Nicodemus because he thought everything was okay. He thought, I'm a son of Abraham. I am a teacher of Israel. I am a Pharisee. I hold in my hand the keys to the kingdom. And Jesus says, unless you're born again, you won't see it. And you won't enter into it. And so, here's what he's saying and what he's saying to all of us. We need Jesus to go to heaven. That's without a doubt. And if you don't have Christ, then you're going to hell. That is without a doubt according to Scripture. But if we take that to people, if we go outside of these walls and say to someone, you need Jesus or you're going to hell, and that's as far as we go. That's a sad, sad message. Because we can't just say you need to be rescued and then not point them to the rescuer. They need to know, yes, you need Jesus. Yes, you are dead in your trespasses and sins. But you need to know the rescuer and you need to understand the apparatus that he uses to do this, to rescue you. If we don't share that, we truly don't share the good news. So many people do share Jesus, but what are we sharing about Jesus? We've got to be sharing the cross. And so this is what Jesus is doing with Nicodemus. He's already let him know how spiritually bankrupt he is. But he doesn't leave him there. Now he's going to explain how it is he is to be rescued, how we are to be rescued. Nicodemus already understands something that Jesus has taught him. The flesh has no part in this. Because everything that Nicodemus was holding dear to him, all of his position and status was based upon the flesh. And so that's what he's holding tight to. And Jesus says, you've you've got to let it go. Flesh has no part in this. The physical aspect of this is an impossibility. And I think that Nicodemus is beginning to see the ramifications of not being born again. But I think he's at a point, and Jesus knows without a doubt, Nicodemus in his mind is probably thinking, now what? Now what? You, you brought me to this place where I can't take another step. I'm trapped. I have nowhere to go. I can't save myself. Now what? And so Jesus takes him to Moses. So I want you to turn in your Bibles in the Old Testament. Turn to the Old Testament book of Numbers. And specifically, turn to Numbers chapter 21. And I'm going to read this to you starting in verse 4 because I want you to understand this is what Jesus is making reference to. This is what he is teaching Nicodemus about. Now, Nicodemus, again, understand this. He would have known this. He would have taught this. When Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, Nicodemus' mind immediately went to this scripture. And so we're going to turn there, and I'm going to read it and share as we go. Numbers 21, beginning in verse 4. And this is after after the Passover, uh, after the parting of the Red Sea. They're, They're in the desert. And it says, From Mount Hor they set out by way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. 
And the people became impatient on the way. Impatient. Humans are so fickle, aren't they? They became impatient. In one sense, this blows my mind. Because of all they had just been delivered from, by God, from the Egyptians. Slavery. And they become impatient. But in reading this and and getting real with myself, here's what I realize. I think we all want to say, wow, I would be like Moses, where I would have the faith and wouldn't question God and wouldn't become impatient. But I think if we're honest with ourselves, we probably can relate a little more to the Israelites here than we can to Moses. How often do we become impatient with God? Things aren't happening fast enough for us. And we fail to recognize and reflect upon the deliverance that He's given us. And we focus on what's not happening that we think should happen. And so I don't know about you, but I definitely do at times. I relate to the Israelites here. Focusing too much on what's not going on. I'm impatient. I'd love to be a Moses, but I'm probably not. But here's what's happening with them. They've grown impatient, and here's why. Here's what's going on in their lives. Verse 5, And the people spoke against God and against Moses, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? And we hit on this on Sunday school, and this wasn't necessarily the plan, but what are they saying there? They're saying, Moses, God, we had it a lot better when we were slaves. We had it a lot better when we were trapped, and we had to work hard, and we were being whipped and beaten, and we weren't free. And we couldn't worship our God like we wanted to. That was a lot better off than we are today in this wilderness where we're going to die. Let that sink in for just a minute. Because what a deliverance they just experienced. The plagues, the Passover, the parting of the Red Sea. Amazing. God moving after 450 years. God moving and acting on their behalf. And they're saying, why have you brought us out of Egypt? to die here in the wilderness. And look at what they say. For there's no food and there's no water. I'll stop right there for a second. There was food. God miraculously delivered quail to them. And they ate it. And it was good. And there was water. And God miraculously allowed water to come from a rock twice. God did this. God provided water for them in the middle of the desert. So there is food. There is water. But listen to the last thing they say. And we loathe this worthless food. Now you might think, wait a minute, something's something's not adding up here. They just said there was no food, and now they're saying we loathe this worthless food. Here's what I think they're talking about there. I think they're talking about manna. They're talking about, at this point, the bread of heaven, the bread that God would bring down with the dew, and it would be there on the ground, And they would go and collect it for that day and make their cakes and have that provision. And even on the Sabbath, God would provide enough for two days to have enough for them. God showing that He is their provision for this. And they say, we loathe this bread. But I want you to know something about manna. It really happened. It really existed. But it's also a shadow and a picture of something greater to come. And that's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ says in John 6 that He's explaining this bread and He says that He is the bread of heaven that has come down. That's Jesus. And so if you take it, plug that in, what are they saying here? We loathe Jesus. We loathe this provision. We loathe this sacrifice. We loathe the one that you have brought down from heaven to provide for us. We loathe your son. Now, this helps build the stage for verse 6. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. You can pass through this real quick and come to that verse, verse 6, and say, that's not fair. It's not fair that God allowed these poisonous snakes to come in and bite people. But understanding what it was that they were saying to God and how they felt about His provision and truly about the ultimate provision that He would provide for His people, Jesus Christ, I think you can understand why He allowed these poisonous, fiery serpents to move in. And here's what happened. 
They move in and they start biting the people so that many people of Israel died. The wages of sin is death. And they're tasting it. This really happened and they were being bit and they were dying. And then in verse 7 it says, And the people came to Moses and said, We've sinned. They're, They're starting to realize something here. They've sinned against a holy God and He hates sin. And there is wrath for sin. And it says, We have spoken against the Lord and against you. And they ask Moses to do something. They say, Pray to the Lord that He take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. But I want you to know something. That prayer was not answered. God did not take away those poisonous serpents from the people. But He provided a provision for them. And look at what He did. It said, And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. See, now God could have taken all of those serpents and just cast them out of the camp, gotten rid of them, but He didn't. Because here's the thing. When we sin against a holy God, He doesn't just sweep it under the rug. Okay? He doesn't just... When you come to God and ask Him for forgiveness of your sins, He doesn't say... No big deal. It's okay. No problem. Sin's a serious issue. And it took a serious remedy to deal with our sin. And so it's not to be taken lightly, either in our lives or in confession. And it was not to be taken lightly here in the camp of the Jewish people. God didn't take those away, but He told Moses, here's the remedy, and here's what it is. You take a bronze serpent, and you put it on a pole. That's all you got to do. So that when anybody's bit, because people were still being bit, all they have to do is look up at that, and that's it. It doesn't say they have to suck out the venom, dress the wound, and then look up at it. It's very simple, very plain, very easy. They couldn't do anything. They were dying. There was no anti-venom with them. So all they had to do was look up at that serpent on the pole. That was it. And so now understanding what's going on here, And it says, so Moses did this, and if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. That involved a little bit of faith. Because you had to first believe that what Moses said, relaying what God had said to the people, was true. You could be bit by that and refuse to look at it and say, I don't believe by looking at this bronze serpent that I'm going to be made well, and you would have died. But at the moment that you looked at it, you would live. And so now I want us to go back to John chapter 3. And I hope now you can see the context of what Jesus is saying here to Nicodemus. Verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, now you know what he's talking about, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Friends, this is the cross. This is what he's making reference of. As the people were dying because of sin... We're all dying because of sin. Every single person in this world is snake bit by sin. We're dying. But yet, there is a remedy. And God doesn't just take away evil in the world. So many people say that. Why does a perfect God allow evil in the world? God's got an even greater remedy. A remedy that doesn't just take away evil. That doesn't just take away sin in the world. But it cleanses you. It makes you a new creation. That's what we need. We don't just need evil to be gone because you'd still be in a sinful state. You must be born again. I must be born again. We've got to be cleansed of our sins. We've got to be a new creation in Christ. And so it says here, as Moses lifted up the serpent, as Jesus is lifted up on the cross, he says in verse 15, that whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. Now here's the thing that you've got to understand what Jesus is saying here. He's saying, don't just believe that I lived. It doesn't do you any good. Lots of people knew Jesus lived. People saw Jesus. But it's believing what He was doing on the cross and how that relates to your sin. That's what He's talking about. Faith in who He is. Faith in that as you see Him in your mind's eye on that cross dying, You place your sins upon that sinless Lamb of God. He's dying for my sins. It's so funny because I 
I try to relay this to my kids, and even Miriam at five years old, she'll talk about Jesus dying on the cross for my sins. She gets it on some level. That it's got to be about her sins. If all we think about is Jesus dying on the cross for somebody else's sins, it's got to be your sins. You've got to place your sins on His head. And so as we do that, whosoever believes... There's an old hymn. Whosoever surely meaneth me. Tina, do you know that song? It's a great song. Whosoever surely meaneth me. Whosoever. You believe that whosoever is you. It means you. You look at the cross, you see, yes, Jesus, you're dying for my sins on the cross, that whosoever is me. And here's the response of God. As you look to the cross, as you look to Jesus on that cross, dying for your sins, you believe He gives you eternal life. That's what He does. Eternal life. Eternal life that's based upon what He's accomplished on the cross. It's not eternal life based upon your goodness and your perfection but based upon what Jesus has accomplished on the cross. Jesus was lifted up. You're dying. You believe. You look. You live. It's a simple, simple message. So simple as it was to the Jewish people as they're bit by a snake. You look. You live. Because as you look, you're believing. You're trusting. You look to the cross and you see Jesus dying. You live. Not just for this life, because here's the thing. Those people that were bit by the snakes and looked at the bronze serpent, they lived, but eventually they died again. And so the shadow in the picture doesn't do full justice to what Jesus did on the cross. Because as you look at Jesus on the cross and you see Him dying for your sins, you look, you live forever. Eternal life is what Jesus gives. Not just life as we live and breathe in the physical. It's an eternal life. So Jesus, explaining this to Nicodemus, had to be amazed. Nicodemus had to be amazed by this. But there's more to the picture, and this is what has recently opened to me, and it's, and it's a warning about this. Because as Jesus is talking to Nicodemus about Moses raising up the serpent, both of them knew the rest of the story. And so I want us to know the rest of the story and the danger that lurks. Turn to 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 18. And again, this was something that I just didn't know was there. I just brushed over it. And it speaks so clearly of what we need to do as Christians and as sharing the gospel. In 2 Kings chapter 18, it says, In the third year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abai, in the daughter of Ze- she was the daughter of Zechariah. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that David his father had done. He removed the high places and broke the pillars and cut down the Asherah. And listen to this. And he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the people of Israel had made offerings to it. It was called Nehushtan. Here's what they're doing. They're taking this bronze serpent in this pole, and every year they're making offerings to it. They're worshiping this bronze serpent. And here's the point. The bronze serpent didn't do the healing. God did. The bronze serpent was merely the the, the figure, the symbol of what God was really doing. Something that their faith was fixed upon, but it was truly God who's doing the work here. And here's the danger for us as Christians. It's possible to sign the cross. You could do that. It's possible to wear a cross. It's possible to preach the cross. It's even possible to draw near to the cross. A lot of Romans in the physical sense who crucified Jesus were as close to that cross as Jesus was. It's possible to do these things and never ever taste of its work. Never drink of the fullness of what was accomplished on that cross. 
It wasn't the snake and it wasn't the pole. It was God. Where's the cross today? The physical cross that Jesus was crucified on. It's gone. It's rotted. Where are the nails? I don't know. They've rusted. Where's Christ? Reigning in heaven. Interceding on our behalf. Able to save to the uttermost right now. We so quickly can just look at a symbol and place our faith in a symbol instead of the Savior. We can look at the apparatus, but not at the rescuer. And we miss the whole mark. That's what the Jewish people were doing. They're looking at the bronze serpent and they're saying, Oh, this saved us. Same thing they did leaving Egypt. We need a tangible representation of God. Let's have a cow. Let's worship this. Because we need something. And so it was destroyed. And so that's the rest of the story. This bronze serpent no longer exists. It was destroyed. And the benefits and the effects of the bronze serpent no longer exist. They were destroyed. The cross that Jesus died on no longer exists. It's been destroyed. But the benefits and the ramifications of the cross exist for all eternity. They exist today for anyone who sees and looks and believes to have eternal life. That's the beauty of what Christ has done. It's not just an image. It's not just a painting. It's real. He's really done this for us. Let's pray together. Father, we want to thank You for the work that You've done on our behalf, sinners, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And Father, help us daily as You've called us, Jesus, to pick up our cross and bear it, to revisit daily what You've done for us on the cross and that we're not going to lose that because it's based upon what You've done. We can't lose it. We we didn't earn it. Lord, help us to make sure that our focus is always on Jesus. Help us, God, to turn our eyes upon Jesus It's the blood of Jesus, nothing but the blood. Help us to make sure that Jesus is the focus of our affections and the focus of our salvation. And Jesus, help us to commune with You. Help us to grow in our faith. Help us to to love You because it's obvious how much You loved us. So help us to do that. Challenge us in these areas. Challenge our hearts. Convict us. Change us. May we have no idols, no matter how religious they may appear. May we have no idols. We worship You. You're living. You're alive. You died and You have been raised. And You're coming back. So as well, prepare our hearts. Even so, come Lord Jesus. And so take this message, take the truth of the Scriptures, Lord, not my words, but the truth of the Scriptures, and place them where they need to be placed in our hearts and in our lives. And do that which only you can do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.